All right, so welcome everybody to our workshop on uh, recovering from and preventing sports injuries. So let's just get myself sorted here. I'm gonna share my screen so that we can go right into our workshop. And you're gonna get some great visuals here so that you can really learn uh, exactly what we wanna to cover today. Whoops, let me go back there. All right, let's just bring this down here. There we go. So how to prevent and recover from common sports injuries. This is uh, one of our body signals workshops and we do these every single month with a different topic. And so we just thought it was a perfect timing to cover this topic. So tell me um, if this sounds like you, uh, somebody that's been maybe missing workouts because of a nagging injury, um, or maybe it's something that's happened in the past and you don't want it to happen again, um, or even some of you that are being proactive and you've seen others that are struggling and you want to prevent problems in the future. And so you know what I mean, like uh, shoulder cuff problems, bad knees, painful elbow issues, really too many athletes and weekend warriors, they get sidelined because of chronic sports injuries. So right now, when we think of where we are, we already have people that maybe have uh, not so good of a sedentary rhythm happening in their life. They have a lot of bad habits. Um, so those are already going on. And then we add a 90-day lockdown to that. <laughs> and that pretty much is just basically throwing gasoline on the fire. So now that we're starting to open back up again, um, we're all finally just getting out to get back to our life. And so a lot of people are out doing landscaping, gardening, getting back to the gym, uh, getting back outside on the lake, um, just getting out and being active again. And uh, a lot of people are just trying to jump back in exactly where they left off, which sounds like uh, an injury waiting to happen, if you ask me. So we call this um, adult onset FAS. FAS meaning falling apart syndrome, right? So either old injuries that are a problem or injuries that are resurfacing that are a problem. So tell me if this is you right now. Are you skipping workouts? Are you thinking about quitting? All because of a pesky problem that, you, that just doesn't seem to go away. Um, so no matter what you do, it just keeps coming back. It's always there. Don't quit yet. Uh, let us help you get to the bottom of it. So don't start thinking that you're just getting old. Um, don't throw in the towel. Stop working around your problem and definitely stop ignoring it. You know what happens when you ignore a problem. You just, it just gets worse, right? So let's do something about it. Let's get you back in the gym, back on the field, back on the track. Let's get you back in shape for the summer. And if you've got time right now, which I know you do, <laughs> this is the time to recover and get in summer shape. Now, before we jump into our material, I want to just do a little housekeeping and remind you that next month, we're gonna be covering our workshop on the inflammation nation. So this is all about inflammation. We're gonna unpack this and go deep with this. And some of you um, that may have encountered um, what we call the COVID-19, which is not the virus, but the gain of 19 pounds during this time. Um, and it's all from bad habits that have been feeding the fire of inflammation many times. So next month, again, we're gonna cover this uh, topic of inflammation. And you just wanna make sure you get signed up for this because it's very closely linked to old injuries, actually. Uh, and so old injuries that are persisting and instead of addressing the inflammation in a healthy way, Many people are relying on medication to try and manage it. So, and especially now that medical offices are opening back up again, I actually have a little bit of a fear that folks are gonna you know, go out there, they're gonna start exercising, they're gonna have injuries, and then next thing you know, they're gonna go to their medical doctor, they're gonna stop popping pills to address things. And that can actually lead to worse outcomes like the opioid addiction. Opioid addictions most commonly come from trying to manage pain from chronic injuries. So I wonder if we're gonna see a spike in OxyContin use um, that can lead to opioid addictions um, that has been trending down. I wonder if we're gonna see that spike up. So it'll be interesting to watch that, but I hope that actually it doesn't happen. And so that's why we really wanna be addressing this topic of inflammation um, and dive deep into it. So 
make sure you tell your friends about this so they can join us too. Anybody you know that's struggling with inflammation or perhaps has a fear that the inflammation they do have may put them more at risk, not just for other sports injuries, joint injuries, but put them at risk for other kinds of vulnerabilities like uh, immune system concerns as well. Uh, join us for Inflammation Nation, very popular webinar, so make sure you get yourself signed up and again, share it with friends, family, coworkers, neighbors, anybody you know that's struggling with this. All right, so let's jump into our information, our material here today. When it comes to physical fitness, or any kind of sports activity, everyone wants the same thing. They want better performance. And so regardless of which activity you use to exercise, whether it's hiking, biking, running, tennis, golf, basketball, football, soccer, rugby, ultimate frisbee, horseback riding, or things like yoga, Pilates, CrossFit, your performance is always gonna be based on three things, technique, programming, and recovery. So when we think of technique, coaches are the experts when it comes to technique. That's their job. When we think of programming, that's you know creating workouts and programs for the athlete. Again, the coach is going to be the expert for that. But when it comes to recovery, I'm the recovery expert. So I'm going to work hand in hand with the coach to help athletes to get their best levels of performance. And uh, the reason why it's so important is, again, if we look at care and recovery, these are some of the essential pieces to this. So rest is important for care and recovery. Rest means, you know, you work out really hard one day, you're going to rest the next day so your body can rebuild that tissue that got broken down from the workout appropriately so that you rebuild and get stronger from it. Now, sleep is another important part of rest. And um, that's actually something that I cover in uh, another workshop. But again, remember that care and recovery, rest is part of that. Fuel is also part of that. Fuel, of course, is important for performance, but it's also important for recovery. And when I think of fuel, I want to be moving, coaching people to move towards anti-inflammatory diets. So that's where you're going to get your best results with recovery. You don't want to be feeding the fire with the food that you're eating. And then also the paleolithic lifestyle. So paleo lifestyle, paleo diet style, that seems to be the best fuel to be using for the best benefits for recovery. And again, I do other workshops on this, so we're not gonna focus on this now, but definitely you wanna check out my other workshops on that. But when we come to care, there's gonna be self-care and there's gonna be professional care. So self-care is gonna include foam rolling, stretching, icing, uh, warming up, bursting during, uh, before, during, and after workouts, uh, like snatch balls or other types of burst exertion. Um, and then, of course, there is professional care. That's going to be massage therapy, physical therapy, athletic trainers, chiropractors. Those are all the professionals that can help with care. All right, so now that we've broken that down, let's now look at what are the uh, problems and faults that occur. Um, either they're actual injuries, uh, either an acute or a chronic injury, or something that isn't an injury, but it still is creating a movement fault. Uh, and so that can affect your technique, which then can lead to an injury or could at least be impacting your performance. There are three areas where these problems lie. The first is technique. So that's about just knowledge. Like, do you know how to do a squat properly? So your coach is going to cue you on that. So your coach could tell you, okay, make sure you're gripping the floor with your feet, that you are uh, pushing your feet apart, like you're tearing a newspaper apart. So that's an example of technique. So you want to have good technique. Otherwise, if you have poor technique, you're setting yourself up for an injury. So the coach is going to be all about the proper knowledge for that technique. Then if we look at fitness, that's going to be strength and flexibility. And again, the coach is going to be important here. Um, you may know how to do things, but you may not have the actual strength to do that technique properly or the flexibility or the balance. And so the coach can help you here as well. Uh, when we look at these um, other pieces, though, you know, you could be an athlete that knows your technique and you still have faults because that's happening in the biomechanics. That's in the function. So, it, for example, structurally speaking, let's say that your pelvis is out of alignment, your sacroiliac is out of alignment. 
And so then you go to do your squat and you're finding that it's, you're being pulled off track. You're like being pulled off to one side off track or it's limiting how deep you can do your squat. So the coach could yell at you all day long about the technique. You could foam roll the hell out of it, but it's a structural fault that's the problem. Or it may be a neurological fault. And so the problem's just gonna persist. The neurological aspect, if that's not addressed, again, what's gonna happen is you're gonna start training around it, and that's gonna lead to poorer performance, increased risk for either acute injuries or breaking down over time to either chronic degeneration or both of these things happening. Uh, so chiropractic care is the solution for both of these things. And so that's what I'm an expert in, is in the movement patterns. And this is what then leads to better training, better performance, and better outcomes. All right, so if we're talking about these things, let's go right into how do we assess them. We start with just static posture. So just looking at someone's posture, what we want to see is that you can see in this picture, for example, the center of the head, right at the ear level, we could say, that's where the center of the head is, that's right over the center of the shoulder. And the center of the shoulder is right over the center of the hips. The center of the hips is right over the center of the ankles. So this is uh, cl close to an optimum posture, what we see here. And so someone may have optimum posture in a static situation, but then when we put it under load, like, such as like with a dead lift, um, now we're gonna start to observe postural deviations that are gonna get exaggerated when it's under load. And this is what, again, can lead to degeneration and breakdown injuries when we uncover that there is a fault when we add um, weight to it. Uh, then if we add movement to it, that will exaggerate it even more. And this example of the overhead deadlift squat, it's the hardest thing to do because you have to have the technique right, you have to have the strength and the flexibility there, um, but you also have to have the biostructural uh, and neurological integrity to be able to do this properly or you're setting yourself up for injury. Um, and so when athletes come to get assessed by me, uh, we can just do an analysis, but uh, you know, postural analysis and so on, but oftentimes they may provide me with um, still images of them do, performing their sport or a video of their technique and their, and their movements. Uh, some athletes are using the Huddle app, for example, to monitor what's happening in their performance. Um, but at any rate, this is where we see the postural issues are exaggerated and the performance gets hindered that can then promote injuries. And the thing is, is that it is correctable. It is correctable. And that's the good news, but we have to find it first. So uh, when I work with athletes, we first need to understand what the true problem is and what challenges they're having. How is it affecting their performance or their life? Um, and are they aware of or even concerned about future breakdowns that may happen if it isn't corrected? So we start with a functional survey. And that survey then helps us to uncover where we're starting from. And then from there, we do a functional assessment so we can really understand what's going on and what is it gonna take to correct the faults. Um, working with a coach for technique and fitness and addressing the biomechanics with my care. So that's how a lot of athletes like to work. So if any of you are interested in uh, taking the functional survey, then just let us know. You'll see a link that's with this, um, with this video. Um, so when we do the recording of it, if you're watching the recording, again, you'll just find the link. And if you don't see it, just send us an email and make a request that you want to take the uh, functional survey. We'll send it right out to you. And then once you've completed that, um, we can actually follow it up with a virtual consultation. Uh, we'll take 10, 15 minutes just to check in with you and kind of understand your unique situation, uh, talk it down and see if we can help. So I'd invite you to do that. If um, any of thing, the things that I present sounds like something that uh, is something you're struggling with or you know somebody, pass this on to them. All right, so what is it that causes these biomechanical faults? Well, uh, in this picture, what we see is that there are a lot of people here. And when we look at these people, what we see is that it's their lifestyle that's causing the problem, right? So our modern lifestyle is engineered to be unnaturally unhealthy. And a lot of that comes from the postures that we're in so many of our, in so many of our daily activities. So whether it's work, studying, grooming, sports, socializing, driving, eating, and sometimes even just sleeping, right? You can have poor posture with sleeping. 
So every one of these folks, what do they have in common? It's poor posture in every activity. And we're spending so much time in this hunched forward posture um, that it has le led to a deconditioning of all the extensor muscles, the extensor posture muscles in the back of the neck, the shoulder, and the mid back. So <clears throat> posture is a big problem with the upper extremity types of injuries. Uh, and so uh, if the upper extremity is, is primarily a muscular joint and those muscles become weakened, what do you think is going to happen to the joint? It's going to break down over time. So improper posture is one of the causes. Another factor that is often overlooked is this, and it's something that we call subluxation. So many people are not familiar with what a subluxation is. So from traumas or jarring of the spine coupled with bad habits, uh, joints can misalign and that causes soft tissue damage. When that soft tissue is damaged, that creates nerve irritation and that can then maybe even cause the disc to swell up. The nerves then tell the body to strap down that joint because the body is gonna to need to stabilize that joint because as the joint moves, it's gonna irritate the nerve more. And so the body's gonna to wanna to try and stop irritating the disc and the nerves. So it'll tighten up the muscles, even spasm them to protect the nerves. When that happens, we lose something called imbibition. So imbibition is the way that we get nutrients in and toxins out of the joint because the disc has a poor blood supply. And so instead, movement is what pumps the fluids in and out of the disc, um, just like a sponge. And so the disc, it's not just like a hockey puck, it's actually a very complex organ, uh, and it acts as a spacer so the nerves can get out and carry the messages back and forth between the brain and the body. So when the disc over time starts to degenerate because it has toxins accumulating and it's not getting nutrients in, that's called degenerative arthritis. And it's called also normal aging, even though it's not normal aging, it's common, but it's not normal. And it's not from just pure aging, it's from having subluxations over time that are not corrected. So long-term subluxations lead to subluxation degeneration. Um, I don't have time to address every upper, upper extremity concern, but I'm going to address the big ones that I tend to see. So if we understand uh, first that if we look at the anatomy, the upper extremity is what is known as an open kinetic chain. And it means that what you're gaining in mobility and movement, ranges of motion in that joint, you're gonna lose in stability and protection. And so you're actually more susceptible to injury in the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist because it is an open kinetic chain. Um, so it's non-weight bearing, which means that unless you're doing handstands, <clears throat> it's gonna remain as an open kinetic chain. In the upper extremity, if we look at uh, just a quick review of the anatomy, um, we see that um, the shoulder includes the AC joint, which is the front where the clavicle, the collarbone, connects with, with the um, acromial process, which acromion process, which is the scapula coming up from the back. The sternoclavicular joint is the joint where the collarbone meets with the sternum. The scapula sits on the back. That's that chicken wing in the back that's kind of floating around with all the soft tissues around it. Uh, and then we have the glenohumeral joint where, where the arm bone comes up into the shoulder joint. The deltoids are the power muscle that moves the shoulder around for when you need strength and power. And then you have the rotator cuff, which is the holding joint. And it's kind of like an eagle claw that comes around the ball of the, of the humerus. And the, the purpose of the rotator cuff is for stability and fine motor movement. So that includes the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, the subscapularis all for internal and external rotation. And um, it's usually here where shoulder pain comes from. So something happens where the joint, where it gets sloppy and loose, and then that leads to um, injuries. Of course, below that we have the elbow, the wrist, and the hand, all part of the upper extremity. Now, it is interesting that the root cause of many upper extremity issues is actually the subluxation in the neck. So tech neck, is, uh, you know, we talk about a pandemic happening right now. Tech neck is a pandemic that's happening right now. And it's really hitting the, our young, the younger generation. I'm seeing it in younger and younger ages. And the next generation is really in trouble because of this. If they don't pay attention to good spinal hygiene, it is gonna be a plague for them 
as they go on and age. So that's a problem that I take very seriously. I wanna educate as many people as I can on proper spinal hygiene because it's one of the key issues that then leads to upper extremity injuries and um, chronic injuries not healing up. And again, it's, I'm seeing it, I'm seeing upper extremity injuries in younger and younger individuals. And I think one of the reasons it's related to the, the neck. So upper extremity issues usually start in the neck. And um, again, if we look at, oftentimes when there is an upper extremity issue, people will also complain of neck issues and symptoms like neck pain and stiffness, muscle spasms, loss of range of motion. Sometimes they will hear joints popping and snapping, even have arthritic changes. Um, but far more commonly, there's actually no outward symptoms in the neck. And so it's just like dental issues. You know, these problems can begin asymptomatically. By the time you feel a cavity, you're in trouble, right? So these things can go undetected and they can get worse. And that can go on for years if they're not caught. So we actually really, it's really important that we get to the root of the problem for the upper extremity and oftentimes it's in the neck. And once we get there, then the real healing can happen. And so when we do find that the root cause of the upper extremity problem is in the neck, it's a very simple three-step process and it is very correctable uh, for the most part, yeah. So we stabilize the system first, then we rebuild to get proper function back again and proper biomechanics and structure, and then we optimize that function and that performance. When we look at the, um, the, the structure, that's one aspect of the, the bony structure, but it's the nerve supply that is the primary communication that feeds the upper extremity coming right out of the neck joints. So from the brachial plexus, it branches out and feeds everything below it. Uh, and so like literally, if we were to cut the shoulder off we would see these wires coming out of the neck that keep all that tissue healthy and healing. So all the blood supply, the lymph, all those tissues are controlled from the nerves that come out from the neck. And so uh, we, what do we see people presenting with as a root cause of these problems? So here are some examples that I've been seeing in my practice. Um, recently, I had an older gentleman come in. He's in his late 70s, early 80s. He was a farmer when he was younger. So you can imagine, okay, a lot of hard work there and maybe some traumas, just that's part of the terrain, right? Uh, so he had a <clears throat> chronic shoulder issue. And so he had just kind of learned to live with it. He didn't think there was anything that could be done, but his son was under care and his son said, no dad, let's get this checked out. So he comes in and literally within a week, he's already seeing that he has much greater range of motion and much less pain in his shoulder. And he's delighted with this. So can you imagine just how his whole quality of life is gonna change now as we continue to get more and more better performance, better function. Um, I also have had a dental hygienist that had actually had a, a fracture. She had a fall. She broke the, her, her, um, her humerus and fractured her arm there. And so of course she is you know, getting it treated as far as the getting the bone set and so on and it has to heal up. She's getting some physical therapy for restoring and rehabbing that. But we also made sure that the nerve supply going to that area was as clear as possible so that she healed up in an optimum way. And it was repeatable, visit after visit. She'd have a certain level of function from doing the PT and so on. And then we would adjust her and immediately following the adjustment, all of a sudden she had way more function. So it clearly was making a big difference on how she was healing up from that injury. So again, this is not just about wait till the injury is healed up and then go seek chiropractic care to see if you can take care of anything that didn't help. Nope. When you have an injury, it's important to actually make sure you have proper nerve supply so it can, as it's healing, it heals up optimally. I also have a carpenter who's under care. And so again, that's an occupational athlete, right? We have professional athletes, we have weekend warriors, but we also have occupational athletes people that need their body for their job. And not just for a good five years, like a professional athlete, but for decades. They need to have a healthy body so they can do their job. And uh, this fellow had trouble with his wrist, uh, elbow, shoulder. Okay, do you see where this is going, right? What did we find in the neck? Yep, we found that there was nerve interference in the neck. And as we corrected that, he found that that whole upper extremity improved. Um, and of course, that affected not just his work life, but also recreationally, 
uh, any kind of um, sports that he wanted to do, yoga that he wanted to do, it helped with that as well. So if any of this sounds like you, then again, if you want to unpack this further, just message me, send us a message, send us an email, a text, and uh, we'll set up a conversation and we can talk it down. And again, we can just schedule a virtual consultation and see how we can help you there. All right, so I thought this was an interesting study to share with you. So when we talk about the upper extremity, grip strength is one of those pieces that helps us to monitor function there. And so this was very interesting that this study found that there was an association of loss of grip strength with poor health outcomes, like cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, cancer outcomes, all causes of mortality. And this was in the, um, the, the BMJ, British Medical Journal. They looked at a cohort study of 500,000 people, and they found that there was a very strong correlation, clear evidence that lower grip strength is associated with a whole range of poor health outcomes. So if you're not like the go-to person for the jars anymore, that may be an indicator that there may be some other health issues that are going on, right? So that's, I thought that was fascinating when I saw that. And so since then, for most people, I'm gonna test that grip strength when I'm doing the exam, because it tells me so much about actually their nervous system. What is it that controls grip strength? It's the nervous system. Now there's another study that actually followed people that were under chiropractic care at measured grip strength. What they found is following chiropractic adjustments, when we reduced the vertebral subluxation, it actually improved grip strength. So if it's improving grip strength, what else might it be improving? It might be an indicator that all causes of mortality is gonna go down, that it's gonna provide greater cardiovascular health, respiratory health, you know, decreased risk of cancer, right? So I don't have a study that shows that correlation, but I certainly do show these two studies together. So there's some biological plausibility here that if we correct the subluxations, improve the nerve supply, we see better grip strength. Those same nerves that control the grip strength are coming out of that area, and they're in charge of running organ function as well. All right, so okay, let's face it. Growing old is not for sissies. <laughs> and so, just, but, but listen, don't let them tell you that there's nothing that you can do about it, right? Let's take action here. Remember, success is reserved for the action takers. So who, who here is an action taker? I know all of you are because you're watching this webinar, right? So if you're watching the webinar, it's because you're ready to take action to do something that's going to either address that chronic injury or address an acute injury or try to prevent those from happening. So bravo for you for being an action taker. So what kind of actions do you need to take? Here we go. So this is your homework right here, pay attention. How do you bulletproof your shoulder? These are some exercises that you can be doing yourself that are gonna really help. And so a lot, everybody knows what a push up is. That's where you're bending your elbows as you're going up and down, right? And so that's gonna help triceps, biceps, and so on. But a push up plus is different. And so you can see in the picture here, the elbows are actually straight. And can you see how actually what's happening is we're going to have a straight elbow and we're going to sink down and let the shoulder joint go back. And then we're going to push the shoulder joint forward. So we're going back and forth, but we're keeping the elbows straight, keeping the arms straight. So uh, you can start by just doing that in the air with your shoulders. Then you can actually lean against a wall and sink into it and back. Then you can go against a desk. So as you go down at an angle, you're gonna be increasing the load. And then finally, you can be right down on the floor as if you're doing a push up. and instead of bending the elbows, you're only gonna be sinking down and lifting up. So that's a great exercise for the shoulder. It actually helps the whole serratus anterior. You know, boxers that have that area really well developed. This is one of the ways to develop that. The wall angel is where you're gonna be standing against a wall and then you're just gonna be having your hands and your arms against the wall and then you're just gonna track up, keeping the, the arms and the elbows back and that again is gonna provide a good stretch and an opening to the chest. Again, stretching and opening this because so often we're in this posture where we're leaning forward. The reach, roll and lift is uh, first you get into child pose and so you're, you're bent over, your, your arms are actually right on the floor you slide that arm forward, turn it over, palm up, and then you're just gonna lift the arm up. 
Now, when you're hunched over, like I have a lot of motion here because I'm upright, but when you're hunched over, it's only going to be a little bit of movement, uh, but that's fantastic for these lower, lower trapezius area. You want to do about eight reps of each one of these exercises. Now, this one is all about bulletproofing the arm and the hand. So we do actually get quite a lot of function of the wrist flex, flexors just in our daily life, but if you want to add more strength there, you just take a tennis ball and squeeze it, and that will uh, strengthen the wrist flexors. For the wrist extensors, the best one for this is to actually get a rubber band, put it around the fingers, and just spread open the fingers. Open, 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 open. And uh, again, don't do too much of a strong rubber band. Start with a very lightweight one. Do that first and just work up to something that has a little bit more tension to it. Again, eight reps is enough for, for these to just keep yourself going. All right, and then this one I like, it's um, called the Life Extension Exercises. And the acronym is, you will love this, YWLT. So um, this one, if you do this regularly, it literally can add years to your life because it's fantastic for the whole upper body. You start with the Y shape, hands up in a Y shape. Make sure that the plane of where your shoulder is, that your arm is not forward, that it's right in line with where your head is, right? So Y, and you're just gonna reach up and stretch towards the universe with your fingers. You're gonna take a few breaths in and out. You're gonna hold that for about 20 seconds. W is sticking your elbows into your back pocket. So driving them right down and back. Scapula are gonna be pinched together as you do that. 20 seconds, couple breaths in and out. L is where you're gonna be having your elbow out to the side in an L shape on either side. You wanna do it so that as you're looking forward, uh, you're, you're gazing at the horizon and in your peripheral vision, you can't see your fingers moving. So your arms are spread wide apart. And finally, the T is the arms stretched out, pointing out as far as you can with the fingers stretched. And again, you're gonna be doing it so that you can't see your fingers wiggling with your peripheral vision as you gaze straight ahead. You wanna do this about 20 seconds in each position. And again, just one round for every two hours that you're sitting, that's gonna reconcile that uh, sitting, uh, you know, gazing at the monitor, sniffing the monitor, that kind of thing. Um, and so, and if you're not at uh, sitting for two hours in a day, just doing these a couple times a day, you know, how often do you brush your teeth so that your teeth will last you your whole life? A couple times a day. Great to do this exercise a couple times a day. All right, so now we're gonna get into the lower extremity. And um, again, just reviewing the anatomy, this is a closed kinetic chain as opposed to the upper extremities, the open kinetic chain. In a closed kinetic chain, it means that we're going to have more um, stability. So uh, the, the open socket in the upper is going to have more mobility, less stability. Closed is going to have an enclosed socket, so there's more stability, less mobility. And then from there, it goes down to the knee, the foot, and the ankle. Uh, and then, uh, so then again, starting with the foot and working our way up, if the foot has any biomechanical faults, that can then affect the ankles, the knees, and the spine, the pelvis and the spine. So biomechanics is gonna work in both directions here. Uh, the lumbars, uh, if we look at just the lumbar spine, which if you see my pointer right here, lumbar spine here is where the nerves come out to control the whole lower extremity. So the function of the lumbar spine, the low back, is actually very important for the lower extremity. The function of the sacroiliac joints as well are very important for the gait. And so if any of these are locked up, it's going to alter the gait, which is going to create more wear and tear on the knees, the feet, and the ankles. So it goes in both directions. Um, to, but just if you look at the entire weight of the upper body is resting right on the sacroiliac joints right here on the sacrum and L5. And so that's a very important area that actually the most common areas that can affect the lower extremity is this L5 sacrum sacroiliac area in this closed kinetic chain for the lower extremity below it. So um, if you're struggling, if you or someone you love is struggling with symptoms of the lower extremity, you might notice that you have trouble with the hip, the knees, the ankles, or a foot problem. Um, and so if, if you're struggling with this, then you're in the right place to hear, hear more about how we discover what the cause of this is. So we're gonna get to the bottom of these issues. 
And really, it's so important that you understand what the real cause of these problems are, because so often uh, people have done all kinds of things if they have a knee problem of treating the knee, when actually it may be the foot that needs more support, or it may be the pelvis or the spine that needs correction. Um, and so, again, if we do address the cause of it, uh, then we can either ad address the injury or prevent an injury in the future and avoid problems in the future. And that allows you then to just live the life on your own terms. So get back to the life you want when you're correcting these problems. Um, as with the upper extremity, let's focus on some of the most common lower extremity issues. Um, and again, we lovingly re refer to these uh, low back pain, hip pain, knee problems, leg pain, ankle issues, foot problems as adult onset FAS, falling apart syndrome of the lower extremity. Uh, so uh, when it comes to things like knee problems, we wanna look on either side of that joint. So if the knee is the trouble, we wanna look at the hip joint and we wanna look at the foot as things that can contribute. So often the knee problem is downstream from an SI, a sacred hip or a sacroiliac subluxation that alters the gait and then wear down, wears down the knee. So for example, um, an internally rotated ilium or pelvis is going to cause a foot flare, an outward foot flare. If you have an outward foot flare, that's going to cause a medial knee problem. So the medial meniscus um, or the medial collateral ligament can be damaged. If you have an externally rotated pelvis, then again, that's going to cause external knee issues for the lateral meniscus and the lateral collateral ligament. So if any of this sounds like you and you wanna unpack this further, again, just connect with me, reach out, and um, we can set up a conversation so that we can talk it down. Um, and again, just uh, find my calendar and we'll get it on the schedule or call the office and my team will get it scheduled. Now, again, looking at the foot is an important piece here. So in our office, we actually do a digital analysis of the foot to be sure that there are no biomechanical faults there. And if there are, it will help us to learn what we need to do to properly support them. So if there is a biomechanical fault at the foot, because our entire weight is on it, uh, that can cause the arch to drop, that can cause the knee to rotate, the pelvis to tilt, and the shoulder to drop, and that just leads to wear and tear in all of those joints. If we get the proper support underneath you, now you have a balanced foundation, and that can improve everything above, which then can improve your overall health as well. All right, and so when we look at the nervous system, the nerves that come out of the lumbar spine are the most common areas of subluxation, nerve interference, that affects lower extremity issues. So the hip, the knees, the legs, the ankle, the foot are all controlled by this lumbar area. And the L3 to L5 is where the nerve roots come out. They join together to form the sciatic nerve, that goes right down the leg and is the nerve supply that controls everything down in the leg and the foot. Um, if you ever, ever had sciatica, pain running down your leg, that's the sciatic nerve that's being affected from the lumbar spine, right? The L3 to L5 area could also be the sacroiliac, um, right? The base of the spine as well. Now, what about self-care? What can you do for yourself? Well, um, foam rolling is one of the best things to do for um, self-care. And so you can literally just um, rest your body weight on the foam roller and then just take five breaths in and out right there. So you just go to the place where it's kind of uncomfortable, it's a little tender in that spot. And that helps you to work with the fascia, any adhesions and uh, anything that builds up there. I like this brand, the proper roller, because I like the shape of it. It's a bit more stable than just one that's a, a tubular shape. And the knobs actually help to kind of grip and, and dig right in there. So again, you just find a place, rest right there, take five breaths in and out, and then you could move it to another place, five breaths in and out. I like to do that rather than trying to figure out how to roll on it, which can feel a little unstable, unbalanced, unsure. So just find that spot and hang out there. And you can use it all over your body from the upper extremity to the lower extremity to the, the buttocks, the spine, and so on. Um, and I think of foam rolling kind of like brushing your teeth. And then the chiropractic care is the flossing, right? So you brush your teeth, but there's something left over. Chiropractic care is getting all that nitty gritty. All right, and so then what else is there? Well, there's the other self-care, which is in the form of exercise. 
Um, and so uh, one exercise I want to mention is something called total motion release. So this is something I'm having really great success with people that are trying this out. And again, this is a self-care piece. Um, if you go to YouTube, you're going to find lots of videos on total motion release. And the idea behind it that I love is it seems to be working at the brain level. So if you have trouble, let's say you have trouble with a shoulder where you have limited range of motion, you only get so far and then it feels hung up or painful. The way total motion release works is you go to the opposite side and you do the very motion that you wish you could do on the other side in a very strong and powerful way. You do the 10 reps of that and then you check and see, oh, hey, there's an improvement on this side. If that's true, then you're gonna keep doing repeated reps on the good side and that again is gonna work at brain level to help your brain monitor and run the other side in a better way. So it helps to break up patterns that you've gotten stuck into. Um, so people are getting great results with that. And then for other types of self-care, when we think of exercises, you wanna think of uh, the, the two categories are gonna be stretches and then um, kind of uh, weight work, weight bearing work so that you're, you're strengthening. So stretches will lengthen and uh, doing work is going to strengthen. Um, I love this, um, this one little um, quote about stretching that comes from Seth Godin. And I think there's so many nuances to it that I just wanted to share it with you. He says, there are two polar opposites, staying still and breaking, right? So don't do anything or do too much and break. And he said, it's easy to visualize each end of the axis, whatever the activity. In between is stretching. Stretching is growth. Extending our reach, becoming more resilient, limber, and powerful. Stretching hurts a bit and maybe leaves us just a little bit sore. But then tomorrow we can stretch further and then and further and further than we could yesterday because stretching compounds. When you're doing it regularly, you're going to get that compounded benefit. If you're afraid of breaking, the answer isn't to stay still. No, if you're afraid of breaking, the answer is to dedicate yourself to stretching. So uh, I like that idea for the physical, but I like it also for your life. Uh, so self-care, again, the best stretch, the best stretch that I find for the lower extremity um, is to do this um, piece where you're gonna, you're gonna have a, a chair next to you and you're gonna kind of be stepping forward and you're gonna put your knee and your foot on the back of the chair. And then you're going to just let your hips slide forward, leaning forward. And that's going to create a nice stretch in the front of the, the quadriceps, the, the front of the thigh. So that's a really nice stretch, especially if you're not, um, if you've got some injuries and you're not feeling so steady. The best stretch is to go all the way and grab the back of the foot and bring it right up to the buttocks as a really nice stretch for the low extremity. Um, but if you're not sure about that, then you can just rest your knee on a chair and then just lean forward a bit and that can get that stretch started. Uh, when we look at um, other types of stretches, again, for the hip joint itself, I like to do a round the clock lunge. So that means that you're going to take a step forward and remember that when you do a lunge, the proper way to do it is your knee is never going to go past your toes. And you want to make sure that your knee tracks right in the center, that it doesn't swerve off to the, the inside or outside. You want to just make sure that it is tracking right in the center and not straying. And then you're going to lunge forward, and then you're going to lunge back. And then you can switch. And then you can lunge out to the side so that you're going to you know, lean out to the side and then come back to the center and then lean out to the other side. So that's called the round the clock lunging. And you do that a few times a day. It's great for the acetabular joint, which is your actual hip joint where the femur comes right into your hip. But it's also good for the sacroiliac as well. And uh, if you're feeling like you're just too sore to do something like that, just uh, standing like on, the, on a step with your foot hanging off the edge of the step and just moving your hip in like a figure eight movement can be good just to loosen things up as well. Uh, and then if you're feeling... Uh, like you want something more advanced, you can actually do a lunge on a wobble board. So you're going to put that wobble board on the ground, you're going to step on it, 
and then you're going to do your lunge forward. And because of the uh, imbalance underneath, you have to work harder, and that's going to develop more proprioceptive input to the brain, and it's going to actually do a lot more strengthening at the same time. So uh, that's, again, for a more advanced lunge. All right, so what about a squat? Love squats. Squats are awesome for the entire lower extremity. And if you wanna know how to do a proper squat, you just have to look at a toddler because they always do it perfectly. They haven't developed any bad habits yet. And the reason is because if they, their head is so big that if they don't do the squat properly, they're gonna fall over either forward or back. So they have to keep that head right up over their center of gravity. So if you look at some of the features of the, the proper squat, <clears throat> It's going to include this idea of the toes being in line with the nose, so going straight forward. Uh, also, you want to have your toes lift up because that's going to create it so that you have more weight on your heels. And that's the safer and healthier way to do the squat. Your knees are going to track right over the toes, never in front of the toes, however. Just over the toes, but not out in front of them. You're going to use your glutes uh, when you're lifting yourself back up. And that is the biggest muscle in the body. And what do we do? We just sit on it all day, right? But it's the power muscle. And so, um, again, doing your squats slowly can be a way to really maximize the value of a squat. You can use a door frame to practice to start out with just for stability. Um, and what you're going to find that is if you haven't been doing it right, and you do just 10 of these in a row, you are going to feel it the next day, the next few days. Like you're gonna be using the handicap rails when you go to the bathroom, right? That's how you know you've done it, right? So uh, doing squats is awesome. Just start out with one really slow squat and you'll get so much value from it. When I say that really slow squat, you, if you haven't tried this out, you're gonna be amazed at how much value a slow squat is. Some people think oh, I'm just gonna do a bunch of rapid fire squats, as many as I can, but actually just doing one slow squat or a couple of them, you're gonna work really hard. And if you're not feeling confident or you feel like you don't have the flexibility to go into a deep squat, you can actually just squat right into a chair. So you, you start with your squat and you just go down slowly, 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 slowly. Now you're really working. And then you come in just as you barely touch the chair, you don't sit and rest, you come right back up. And your glutes are gonna be working so hard, especially in the beginning. And so you're gonna be working, 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 just very slowly doing your squat. And that is how you get a really good workout. In fact, just doing a couple of slow squats, it can get you panting and sweating. Uh, so I love squats as uh, really healthy for full lower extremity and the spine itself. Now, what is it that people do to address injuries most commonly? Uh, the allopathic options look something like this. When we look at um, heat, for example, I just want to go through each one of these. And you know, sometimes I have people come in and they say, doc, should I take this drug? And I say, I don't know, because what do you want for your outcome? That's the important question. What is your objective of taking that um, particular drug? Is it just to have symptom relief? If that's all you care about, then maybe the drug is a good option. But if your goal is actually uh, to have a successful outcome, if, then there's more important questions that you want to be asking. So better questions are going to lead you to better answers. So maybe a better question to ask is, what is the cause of my problem? Can it be corrected? And how can I correct it? So um, with all the different options that are out there, you do need to know what about the safety and the efficacy of each of these options? Uh, what about the short-term and long-term results? And so let's just unpack each one of these, look a little bit more closely, and just understand what is the premise behind them. So heat, you know, might bring some relief, but heat, remember, um, can also drive inflammation. So anytime that you have tissue damage, you're going to have some inflammation as part of that problem. And so yes, heat can relax the muscle, but it's also a vasodilator. So that can actually drive and increase chronic inflammation. Bed rest. Okay, in the first 48 hours of an injury, rest is important. So you're just letting that tissue rest so it can heal. But anytime after that, rest is gonna be, usually it's gonna be a bad idea because you need to get up and get moving. Remember, we talked about the imbibition that gets uh, interfered with when we strap down that joint. So 
bed rest is actually going to drive that loss of inhibition, which is going to lead to degenerative change uh, because you're just not getting the nutrients in and the toxins out. And it also can contribute to muscle atrophy as well. And that can just be a whole downward spiral. Now, what about drugs? Well, drugs, their intent is to cover up the symptoms. Uh, and so remember, your symptoms are body signals. It's your body letting you know that you have an injury and that you need to change something. You need to do something about it. So understanding the language that your body is speaking is so important. What you do with that information, right? I want you to understand and learn what your body's trying to tell you. And it's trying to tell you you're moving away from health and you need to change something. But if you take a medication so you don't feel it, you don't have to change anything. You could actually be um, creating worse and worse damage while you're feeling better. So drugs are not often the best way to go because of the fact that they can mask the problem. There was a study that was interesting that showed that just looking at pain relief, no other outcome at all, just the pain relief, 58% of people felt like drugs were effective. 54% felt chiropractic was effective, 48% felt PT was effective. So they were all pretty close, uh, but they all had very different safety and side effects. And they also had different long-term efficacy um, because they all started with a different premise. So uh, as far as physical therapy goes, it's excellent for treating the soft tissue uh, surrounding the problem, but remember, we have to also address the problem itself. So, PT, um, and remember the problem may be that structural neurological aspect, uh, the motor unit and the damage and the derangement in the joint. So the PT is helpful if it is recovery or rehab oriented. If it's more symptom management, it's not gonna be as effective. So again, what is the premise behind it? Okay, steroid injections. Oh my goodness. So steroids are very powerful anti-inflammatories that are also very dangerous. And the reason they're dangerous is they can lead to long-term joint damage. So literally, you're trading acute pain for chronic degenerative problems because there can be long-term damage to the synovial joints. It can actually break down the very tissue that you're trying to heal up. And so that can then lead to long-term instability, and it can compromise that stability and the health of the joint. So this is something you want to avoid as, if possible, as much as possible, because it can interfere with future ability to heal that joint and lead to chronic degenerative problems. Now, when we get to pain management, okay, at this point, this person is desperate and it's not at all about addressing the cause. So you still need to go back to what is the safety and the efficacy of this option. What's the most conservative? I think that's the best way to go. And at the very least, what is equally effective, but also safer? Um, and again, I'm comparing this to drugs and surgery. What are the, the alternatives that are safer and more effective or as effective as drugs and surgery? And again, what about the cost effectiveness? What about the adverse outcome risk? What about addiction issues, right? And surgery, of course, everybody wants to avoid surgery if they can. Now, if we look at what the conventional medications are, like over-the-counter, speaking of like over-the-counter category, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, like Motrin, Aleve, Advil, that kind of thing, that's been the most common choice for symptom relief for most people. Like, oh, I worked out too much or I got an injury. They go directly to the NSAIDs. And while they may be able to alleviate inflammation, they also may actually damage the cartilage at the same time that you're trying to address the inflammation. Uh, what you also may not know, you may not be aware of, is although this is the most conventional approach to arthritis as well, um, this class of drug is, uh, it, it actually may be associated also with damage to the liver, and also it may come as a shock to you, but it may be even leading to premature death. In fact, 16,000 people a year are dying from properly prescribed NSAIDs. So the, not even an overdose or using it the wrong way. Using it the right way, 16,000 people a year may be dying from that. Um, and in fact, of all the side effects of all the drugs, 10% um, come from the NSAIDs. 
and 10% of the drug-induced liver damage is being caused from NSAID use. So who here would rather use a natural approach, right? Everybody? Yeah, I would say so. And so let's look at the natural alternatives here. So when someone comes in with um, joint pain, uh, I, I, I'm very discerning about this, so I use different products depending on what's going on. So for acute joint injuries, like less than 30 days, I'm gonna look at Ligaplex 1, which is the building blocks for all of that connective tissue. Boswellia complex, which is a combination of uh, frankincense and turmeric. Um, there's some ginger and celery seed um, thrown into it too. Fish oil, so important to address inflammation in a healthy way. Uh, and for, again, a new injury, go to cola is an excellent herb to use for acute injuries. When we look at post-acute injuries, like up to 90 days, I'm going to look at Lycoplex 2 um, as a different building block for the, the tissue once it's gone past that acute stage. Uh, and then also the Boswellia and the fish oil. If I look at what do I need to do for long-term joint support for this person, glucosamine synergy is very good. Boswellia and the fish oil once again, um, and then MSM can be very good as well. And they can all kind of work together in a very synergistic way. Um, many folks nowadays are also exploring hemp and CBD for inflammation and joint pain. Um, I'll tell you what, I get so many samples of CBD products. <laughs> People are sending them to me, dropping them off. And so I test them. Yep, is it good or not? And my testing has shown in the, the I mean, I, there's, there's, there's probably 30 different ones that I've tested up to this point. There's two that seem to shine as far as being um, effective and a good match for people. And those two are the standard process hemp oil complex and the, uh, the Verum Gold. So um, let me tell you a little bit more about that. And um, also before I leave this um, page, uh, turmeric and boswellia are also useful for other, another type of sports injury, which we haven't covered yet, which is concussions, right? So when there's brain inflammation, the boswellia and the turmeric are really important for that. So I'm gonna cover that in a minute, but first let me just tell you a little bit more about the Verum Gold and why that seems to test quite strongly for a lot of folks. So first off, it has the highest uh, recorded bioavailability. Uh, so that means that when you take CBD in through your digestive tract, um, not a lot of it actually is able to get absorbed in most formulas. But this formula has 20 times more bioavailability than a lot of the common or conventional CBD or, or hemp oils. It also is number one in stability. So it doesn't need to be refrigerated, has a two-year shelf life, and it doesn't degrade in the stomach. Um, and it's also water soluble. So that's one of the reasons why it is so bioavailable is because it's 100% water soluble. And it's water soluble and stable because of the nanostructured liquid and encapsulation technologies that they use. So um, the way that it is, um, the formula that is used, it actually gets right through the stomach without being opened up. And once it gets through the stomach, that's when it opens up and that's when you can absorb it more effectively. They also have really good research. So I haven't found a lot of CBD products themselves that actually have the research behind them, and this one does. And um, because it is so bioavailable, it also has the lowest effective cost, meaning you need less of it to get the same amount of benefit. So if you're interested in this, there is actually a special, if you go to virum.biz forward slash Wellspring Market, you can get the first month for just $19.95. So you can give it a try. So if you wanna do that, go right to that link and uh, you can try it out. Now, concussions. So I want to cover this because with sports injuries, this is actually a big deal. And many times people are, you know, thinking of their extremities, but the head is an extremity in a way, right? And so when the head is concussed, it can cause all kinds of problems, including it can increase extremity problems and, and it increase the incidence of extremity injuries. Um, and so I'm actually part of a national organization of chiropractors that work with professional and elite athletes in uh, some of the major sports, the NHL, baseball, NBA, NFL, um, all of all these sports that can have these head-on collisions and concussion problems. That, and these problems can go far beyond the brain as well. So if you just check out what does the research show us here, what it shows us is that there are a lot of problems 
one in five high school athletes experience concussions and 33% of them occur at practice. So a lot of times at the games, that's where you have the, uh, the coach, of course, is there, but so is the, uh, the medical doctor, the orthopedic surgeon, the athletic trainer, the physical therapist, like they're all there at the games. But at practice, sometimes these are not even being observed. The coach is even, isn't even seeing it happen. And so a third of those, of those concussions are happening at practice. Um, also, it's important to note that many people think concussions happen just with those collision types of sports, like football, for example. But we know that the contact sports may actually have a higher incidence of concussion because they don't have the headgear that's protecting the person. So contact sports like basketball and lacrosse um, and volleyball, that kind of thing. So, and the women's sports, I think it's, let's see, it's uh, six out of the top 10 sports are actually women's sports that can have head injuries. So um, we also find that twice as many concussions happen in high school versus the collegiate level, and then twice as many happen at the collegiate level as do in the professional sports. So the professional sports get a lot of the, the media attention, but actually the, the most common age group to, to suffer from concussions is 10 to 14 year olds. So it's happening in our, in our young teens. We see that 5 million annual concussions are happening in the US and the highest growth rate again is in the 10 to 14 age range. 70% of high school athletes played despite symptoms of a concussion, right? So there's a lot of ambiguity that's happening around concussions. So we have athletes that are playing even though they have a concussion and they're at risk for what's known as second concussion syndrome where they didn't quite heal up, their brain was still inflamed and injured, they went back into the game, got a second hit, and their athletes, eight, actually 18 athletes a year are dying from second concussion syndrome. So it's, a, it's terrible, it's horrible, it's a serious thing. Uh, but at the same time, you'll also have this hyper awareness now about it. So then there are parents where their athlete gets injured and they're so worried that even though the athlete is ready to play again, they're being held back because they're just not sure and they're hyper aware of it. So there's a lot of ambiguity around this. And uh, so I think that one thing we have to recognize is that there's, uh, when we look at what are the ways that it's being addressed, again, that's where a lot of the ambiguity lies as well. So for example, the guidelines from the AMA say as far as medications go, although it's often used to treat the symptoms, you want to avoid using medications because they can mask the symptoms if you're getting worse. And if you're getting worse, you want to know if you've got a concussion. It also, the, the medication can alter your mental status. And so that you want to monitor very closely. The other thing that's really important, and right now I'm talking to you moms out there that don't want your kids to be in pain. So, you know, your kid gets concussed, they've got a headache, they don't feel good. You go right to the medicine cabinet and you're starting to dole out the NSAIDs. Oh my goodness, that can be very dangerous because the NSAIDs can actually increase the risk of intracranial bleeding. So that's the worst way to go. So there actually are no medications that can be used appropriately for concussion. So that means you have to do something else. You can't take drugs or you're gonna be actually more at risk for the concussion. Now look what some of the research is showing us. They found that athletes who suffered a concussion, look at this, were 3.7, almost 3.8 times more likely to get a muscle or ligament injury. Very interesting. Why would that happen? It's because the writing reflex is wronging you. So I wanna just to unpack this a little bit here. One of the first tests that I do with someone that's been concussed is I wanna look at their proprioception. That's their brain's ability to know where their body is in space. So one of the things I have them do is I have them just take a, you know, just stand up, take a breath in, close their eyes, and then I watch what happens. If we take the visual cues away that might help them to keep their balance, all of a sudden we start to see that they lean off to the side and that they actually lose their balance. That's a sign that the brain has lost its sense of where the body is in space. If it loses the sense of where the body is, you put that, that athlete back into play and they are moving and running and jigging and jagging and their brain thinks their knee is right underneath them as they take a quick jag, but actually the knee is off out to the side 
and then you're going to blast that. You're going to get that ACL injury because of the angle is wrong. And so you, the writing reflex is trying to actually take care of you from the brain because it's distorted. The writing reflex is wronging you and it's actually creating these ACL ligament uh, tears and meniscus tears as well. And what happens to a high school athlete if they get an ACL damage? That might blow their chances for college scholarships and that sort of thing. We also find that there's an increased risk of Tommy John surgery. So with the throwing sports, so once again, there's a loss of that proprioception where the brain has lost track of where those joints are. And so you can get those tears that happen. And again, the increased risk of surgeries. There's also a false diagnosis of autoimmune disease that happens. So remember the brain is in charge of running everything. So when the brain is injured, chaos can start to happen. And what happens is the, there can be a leaky gut situation where the, um, the digestive system, within three hours of a, of, a, of a concussion, what we find is that there can be this gassiness, bloating, diarrhea, constipation. And what's happening is the gut is, leaky gut's happening. And so when leaky gut happens, you're getting food that's crossing into the body. It should have stayed in the digestive tract. It's getting, it's undigested. It's not broken down properly. That can then start to circulate. It can actually go through the blood-brain barrier because of the injury to the brain. When those proteins accumulate in the brain, the immune system starts to go after them and attacks it, which then causes more swelling, more inflammation, and then that then affects the whole body. So it's terrible, and it happens all the time with brain trauma because the brain's in charge of running everything. And it, all those messages go through the spinal cord, that's running every system, organ, every cell, and you can't live for a second if you don't have nervous system control. So when the nervous system is fatigued because it's on overdrive, systems just start to shut down and everything starts to go haywire. The digestive system is directly correlated with brain injury. We also find things like fascial adhesions can create strain in the body. So if you've ever had plantar fasciitis, you know how painful that can be. Well, you can get that same fasciitis and fascial adhesions in the dura right along the spine. So you can get pain all through the spine and in through the joints and the extremities and so on. And again, that can happen um, as a result of the, the brain injury. And then of course that joint dysfunction can then lead to other injuries as well. So there's a whole cascade that can happen, happen there. So brain health and concussion, um, it's not just about the function of the brain, it's about the function of the whole body, performance of a concussion, uh, performance of the body, the injury prevention means we have to recognize that there's been a head trauma, even if it wasn't a concussion injury. Because if it was a blow to the head, it could actually cause subluxations in the upper cervical spine, and that can actually interfere with function in the body as well. Uh, so the subluxations and the alignment issues with the nerves um, can actually affect proprioception. People can feel like they're falling forward because of that lack of proprioception. And then what, what happens is that puts stress on the hamstrings and the glutes, which can then tighten up. When that tightens up, that actually increases the probability of hamstring pulls as well. So you can see there's quite a lot that's involved when we're talking about concussions. And again, it's not just about brain, it's about the body. But we also know that a lot of the kids' concussions are actually going underreported. And we have these studies from the AMA that show that after one head trauma, we can actually see a decrease in grades. Um, and, and again, with, with them being underreported, that means that they could be a single concussion. And if it's not tracked, it could lead to a second concussion syndrome, which as we saw, can lead to lasting damage in the brain. We also found in studies that it leads to a decrease in grades, a decrease in SAT scores, which then can actually interfere with the likelihood of going to college. That's a UCA, UCLA study that showed that. So um, again, it's not just on the field, but it's in the classroom too. So what do we do about this? Well, we, we really have to look at the fact that we need to have a baseline test with our athletes. We need to know what is proper brain and body function for that athlete, so that if, if they do get a concussion, a head or brain injury, we want to know when are they actually healthy enough to get back into play. So if we do a test before they have a, an injury, then we have something to compare it to. We actually have a device we use in the office that is um, the only FDA approved device that actually measures 
the brain function by looking at balance and reaction time. And so what we do in the office is we actually do what we call a selfie healthy, where we are taking that self-assessment of their baseline when they're healthy, and then if they do go into play and they get injured, we can come back and test them again. If we test them and they're at the same level, they can go right back into play. If they're not at the same level, we're gonna hold them back and let them heal and help them to heal properly so that when they do go back into play, they're safe because we don't want that second concussion syndrome to happen to anybody. And so again, we have to recalibrate after injuries and make sure that that writing reflex is working properly as well. So we're gonna be testing that proprioception as well. Um, and after any kind of hard or serious injury, we wanna be screening for, is there any leaky gut happening? Do we need to retrain the eyes? Do we need to fully restore the brain before that athlete goes back into play? Now, if any of you out there are thinking, oh my gosh, I've had concussions, or I, my kids had concussions, or I'm concerned about my kid having a concussion, then just reach out to us and you can come into the office and we can actually do that test to see whether you have any lasting, long-lasting brain function problem with proprioception, with balance, with reaction time. And we can also do that uh, selfie healthy for your athlete to see what their baseline is. Um, so just reach out to us. We can start with a virtual consultation to see what your concerns are, unpack that, and then we'll know if it makes sense for you to come into the office so we can scan you and find out what's going on for you or your athlete. All right, so what do we do? What does a chiropractor do about all this? We want to be correcting the cause. So chiropractic corrects the interferences between the brain and the body so you can heal. And that actually helps you heal not just from nagging injuries, but it also protects yourself from chronic degenerative change or future problems. Um, and so it's interesting that studies actually show that right after a chiropractic adjustment, there's increased cortical activity in the brain that then stimulates and leads to greater strength. They've actually been able to measure that, that athletes have greater strength after an, a chiropractic adjustment. So many athletes actually realize that chiropractic care is a secret weapon that they can use, that it can actually improve their performance. A lot of athletic teams have a chiropractor on their team, not just for treating injuries, but for making sure that they have optimal performance. So many more and more people now are using chiropractic as one of their success strategies for, in their lifestyle protocols so that they can be the healthiest human being possible. So subluxations, remember, are where there is joint misalignment, soft tissue damage, inflammation, nerve irritation, muscle spasm, that lost imbibition that leads to the degenerative changes in the discs, the joint fixation, and all of this can actually, the subluxations can lead to chronic sports injuries. So how do you know if you have a subluxation? If you're like me, you're wondering, what do I need to do to get checked? So in our office, we use five different objective criteria to determine if somebody has a subluxation. We use instrumentation that shows us if there's damage to the nerve supply to the organs, the nerve supply to the muscles. We look at how well you're adapting to the stresses that you're under. We also look at motion palpation, feeling has the joint been strapped down in an area? Likely there's a subluxation in that area. And even the static palpation of measuring is a vertebra out of alignment, then that's an indication there may be subluxation there as well. We look at posture because the posture is the window to the spine. And so looking at posture, if it's distorted, it's gonna be a reflection that there may be a distortion in the spine as well. And then we also can use x-ray. So x-ray looks right in at the bones and the joints, and it doesn't necessarily tell us where we're gonna adjust, but it tells us how long has the problem been there and how long is it going to take to correct it. And what can we expect for correcting it? Have we caught it in time? And how much um, correction is possible? So x-rays are very useful for that as well. And so uh, again, that's what we do in our office. And that helps us to then understand what is the cause of the problem. So we're not just treating the symptoms, but we are correcting the cause. But how could you correct the cause and get back to health if you never found out what the root of the problem is? And so um, again, what we do is we get together, we discuss your case, we do a complete report of findings um, where we then go over and ex fully explain the findings. 
what our recommendations for care are, and to answer any questions that we may have. Um, and so again, the way that we do all of this, I mean, if you went to a hospital to get this kind of an extensive uh, examination, you know, the cost could be a, a few thousand dollars, but they don't even do these tests in the hospital. In our office, the cost of it is about $210. Um, and so this is so that we can get all of this information so we really understand what's going on and we know what the cause of the problem is and whether or not we can help. Make sure you're in the right place to get what you need. Um, and so if you look at what the costs are, you know, no wonder we have a $2 trillion healthcare burden because most people are using that allopathic model that is so, it's not cost effective and it has sometimes the adverse outcomes as well. Whereas chiropractic care is shown to be safe and effective. So how do we correct the cause? It's again, a three-step process. We need to make sure that we are breaking the bad habits. So if you're subluxated, the only way to correct it is with specific chiropractic adjustments. Um, so breaking the bad habits is one leg of the stool. Uh, again, looking at working with your trainer, if you have any bad habits with your technique and so on, breaking those bad habits with posture um, and with how you're exercising. And then adding the specific exercises in so that you can get your whole spine stronger, get the extremities strengthened and lengthened, and that protects you from future injuries as well. Uh, but if you have subluxations, chiropractic adjustments are the only things that are going to address that. And only chiropractors are trained to find and correct subluxations. Uh, there's a whole art and science behind it. And it is very highly specific. It's also, in our office, we use very gentle techniques. We just use light touch techniques that help the brain to then correct the alignment of the vertebrae so that you then optimize that nerve supply, which optimizes function. So we're realigning, returning to normal motion, returning to normal function in the spine. That reduces stress and interference in the nervous system. And then that normalizes the nervous system's input and communication. So the brain is getting accurate information of where the body is in space. It's safe, it's effective. It's actually the largest drug-free healing approach in the world. And millions of people get adjusted and have been doing so for over 100 years. Um, and so if you think of, many people are thinking, oh, I just need to do the exercises, I just need to break the bad habits. So, you know, those are two important things to be doing, but you have to correct the subluxations as well. And the sweet spot is when you're doing all three, that's where, where you're gonna get your best results. So um, if you're only doing some of that, then you're going to be underperforming. Um, and so we really want you to make sure that you're doing the work so that you, your work is going to be at the highest level of performance. So remember, um, living around the problems, stopping living your life to the full extent that you want to be, popping pills, ending up you know, addicted to Oxycontin, that is not the way to go. And so doing the right thing can actually give your body the best chance of healing up those old chronic injuries, addressing those acute injuries in the best way possible so they heal up fast and don't turn into chronic injuries, as well as just preventing future injuries by having optimal function in the body. Um, so here's a, an example of somebody in my office, uh, Frank, who came in and um, he was wanting to solve his issues and avoid medications. Uh, but he also wanted to avoid a costly knee surgery that was being proposed. And um, so he got under care, we had great success, um, and he avoided that. And uh, in this testimonial, he says that that costly knee surgery was eight years ago, but I just saw him the other day, and he says, oh my gosh, that was 15 years ago. So he continues to use chiropractic as one of his strategies for optimum performance and for avoiding degenerative change and future injuries as well. And it keeps him, as he says, keeps him upright and moving well. Now I wanna share this story from Sandy and she says that she tells the story of how she had stopped her daily walks and because she had so much pain in her foot. And she also had pain in her neck and her shoulders and her arm. Um, but once she started to get care, she was able to walk again. And uh, you know, it wasn't just about adjusting her foot. We actually had to adjust the spine, which is the nerve supply to the foot, and that allowed that improvement in function. So she was able to walk daily again, but she also said that the pain in her neck was gone. Uh, she was able to use her right arm again, that that had been limited. And I love what she says here. She says, I've learned to listen to my body 
And now when something is off balance, I'm able to make adjustments and to change the situation. So without Dr. Rice, I would not have been able to enjoy life again. She's my hero and her staff is the best. Um, and then also just recently, um, Michael was in our office and he started care just a, a few months ago. And when he came in, he was already living a pretty healthy lifestyle, but he had been an athlete all his life and really loved being active, but he had a knee that had deteriorated and it was bone on bone. And so he really wanted to just hold on to as much function as possible, but it was really interfering with his ability to be active and do the sports that he loved to do. So once he got under care after a couple of months, it was golfing season. He wanted to go golfing. So he had enough improvement that he was able to actually get out, get on the golf course. Not only that, but he actually was able to participate in a golf tournament, which meant five or six rounds of golf in just a few days. He came in second place with his team. That's a big success, success story there. So we're excited to just continue to work with him so he gets more and more function. All right, so I, I think you kind of get the idea of where all this goes. And so what do you do about it? You know, how about you? Uh, do you know, how do you know if you have subluxations? Uh, so checking the posture is one of the first things that can be done. And so I'm not right there with you, but if you uh, just, you know, work with each other, if you have someone here with, there with you, check each other's posture. If you see distortions in the posture, that could be a sign that there could be subluxations. So that's something you can do right there yourself. Like, for example, if, um, if there's a high right hip, that means that there literally could be 15 more pounds on one side of the body than there is on the other. You multiply that times 10,000 steps a day, that's 150,000 extra pounds on top of what regular body weight would be for that day. You can see how that can lead to wear and tear. So if you're wondering about, about your spine and nervous system, or how about your families or your kids' spines or nervous systems? Uh, if you're like me, you're wondering what's going on inside of you right now. And so if you don't know, if you're not under chiropractic care, then the next steps are easy. And that means just reach out to us and let's, have, let's talk it down. So just reach out. We can get scheduled for a virtual consultation. That's on me. We'll spend 10 or 15 minutes. We'll find out what's unique in your situation. And we'll see what, what the best advice I can give you. Uh, and that may be that we invite you into the office. And if we do, we actually have a special where if you go to our website right now, we have this special where instead of it being $210 for the new patient exam, we're actually capping it at 47. So if you go to the website and it's not there, it means that we've capped out our limit. Um, and so just go check it out. If it's still there, it means that please contact us right away. And uh, so you two can come in. Uh, and if it is capped out, at least please contact me and we can have a virtual consult and that's on me. All right, and again, just think of any friends or family members you have, if they're struggling, please pass this link on to them. Of course, I would want to reach out and uh, speak with them as well, see if we can help. All right, so you get the idea here. Now, pro procrastination, why do I have this slide up? Because I'll tell you what, in 35 years of practice, I will tell you that not a week goes by that I don't encounter somebody that says, boy, I wish I'd known about this sooner, right? I wish I had done something about this sooner. And uh, all of you that have old injuries, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're thinking the same thing. I wish I had taken care of this sooner. So it's because of this that we're on a mission. We are on a mission to check as many people as we can so we can get them the help that they need sooner rather than waiting until it's too late. But we need your help to help as many people as we can. So um, if you have a loved one, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a coworker who's struggling, and maybe it's you that's struggling, let us see how we can help. Um, and just schedule a virtual consultation today, pass on the link to those who are also struggling and looking for a better way, and we would love to see you and know how we can help. Schedule a consultation today to see how we can help. I loved spending this time with you. Please get on our workshop next month, which is all about inflammation, and uh, spread the word because lots of people struggle with that too. Thanks so much. We'll talk again soon.